On the phone, it is a pleasure to welcome to the program the founder of Labor Notes, author of several books on U.S. labor, currently a visiting scholar at the Center for the Study of the Production of the Built Environment at the University of Westminster in London, a member of the National Union of Journalists, Kim Moody, on his latest On New Terrain, How Capital is Reshaping the Battleground of Class War. Uh, Kim, welcome to the program. Well, thank you. Thank so, you for having me. So your your book is um, is written in, in basically three sections. Uh, the the first um, speaks to uh, where we are in terms of of labor, and um, and really uh, attempts to um, I guess question some of the basic assumptions that we have about labor uh, today in this country, uh, myths as to. The, the the state of labor. What is the 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 the, the primary myth that um, you think needs to be addressed? Well, what I was trying to address in that part. I mean, obviously, if we think of labor as the union movement, it's in very bad shape. I mean, there's just no getting around that. But if we look sort of beneath that, uh, at at the changes that people often suggest are the reason for that, namely the changes in the structure of the working class itself, uh, the decline in manufacturing and, and so forth, and the rise of services are often given as, as at least one of the reasons um, why unions haven't been able to, to organize. Of course, the U.S. government and, and the employers are probably the main reason for that, but nonetheless. So what I've tried to do is look at, well, how, how has the working class in, in the U.S. changed, uh, and, and what does it mean? And, and what I'm saying, to, to summarize it really uh, as briefly as possible, is that, yes, manufacturing jobs have decreased, although actually the output of manufacturing uh, has continued to increase, even even today under this slow, uh, slow recovery. Um, but the increase in, in so-called service sector jobs, if you look at this, many of these jobs, I won't say all of them, but many of these jobs are organized uh, in, in the same way that capital, the employers, have, have always organized jobs. Uh, that is to say that people live from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, they work under the command of management. Uh, you know, they're dependent on, on the labor market for their livelihood. Uh, and they create the value, even in these services, uh, that is the wealth of society. So if you look at workplaces like warehouses or hospitals or hotels or, or other kinds of so-called service industries, you're looking at people who are working in conditions that are pretty much comparable to those of a factory uh, in, in most respects. Uh, I, I want to I circle back to the increased productivity uh, in a moment, but isn't the, the, hasn't the, um, the assessment of the problems with changing from a sort of, I guess, a manufacturing to a, a service uh, in terms of uh, of labor, has been a function of the way that the labor communicates with each other. I mean, so so if I'm at a a, a hotel, I'm I'm dispersed throughout the, uh, the 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 hotel. If I'm if I'm a home health care worker, I'm obviously uh, much more isolated than I would be if I was working in a factory and we're all in one building and we all go out uh, one door at uh, you know uh, at, at the change of the shift. Well, actually, um, to to. Factories were never like that. If you take an automobile factory, which would have been the sort of paradigm of, a, of an industrial worker, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, right? Workers don't all work in the same place. They're spread out over huge buildings. People on an assembly line don't work, you know, close together. They can't talk to each other while the thing is going and, and so on and so forth. The collectivism that came out of uh, you know, industry out of, of factory work or mining or, or construction or these kind of uh, industries or transportation 
uh, doesn't come from the fact that everybody's close together in one building. There are very few manufacturing uh, setups that involve simply one building, at least for the last, you know, 50 or 100 years. Uh, and so what I would say is actually if you look at a warehouse today, uh, they not only look like factories, but they're organized around, you know, very similar uh, lines of production work, the way workers work. They they do, uh, you know, as much as a factory, come into contact. Sometimes they work in teams to unload trucks and, and reload them and so forth. Or if you think about a hotel, um, yes, people are working in individual rooms, cleaning them or, or working in the restaurant or something like that. But here you actually do have several hundred people working in, in one building, quite literally, or in a hospital or a hospital complex where you have thousands, thousands of workers uh, of, at all levels, uh, professionals, but also all the you know, non-medical staff uh, that, that work in these places are, are, are at least as concentrated today uh, as you know, factory workers uh, still are or, or were you know, 50 years ago. So uh, th that's what I'm saying is that if you look carefully at the way these jobs are done, they're organized along the same lines. Lean production, for example, is common in hospitals today as it is in factories. Uh, and it's common in hotels, and it's common in just about any kind of uh, large-scale um, workplace, whether you're producing paper or services or or actual goods or, or whatever. Um, because the, for capital, this is the, the easiest way. They have to have control over the workforce. That requires everything from the old Taylorism to lean production, and now – Going beyond that, even all the methods of surveillance that are used on the workforce in all the places I've mentioned, and 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 many more. So I would I would say that the the differences are not as clear as people often think. Uh, people are under severe work intensification uh, under the norms of lean production and and beyond. Uh, you know, so well, there's a lot of pressure. Will on, you, on today's workforce. Uh, I mean, uh, for the sake of those who are not as as familiar with the nomenclature, w w just uh, tell us what you mean by lean production. Okay, this is this was introduced in the United States in the 80s. It it's, uh, originates in Japan in the 1950s and 60s, particularly the Toyota Motor Company and so forth introduced it. What what it says is that. To make a factory or any workplace efficient, you have to eliminate waste. Now, what is waste? Waste could be inventories, for example, or buffers of any kind between phases of production. But it can also be workers. And so in a, in a lean production situation, what uh, the, some of the labor notes people called management by stress, what you do is suppose you have 10 workers performing you know, something along an assembly line or, or a department. Uh, you remove one of them and see if they can produce the same amount. And then you can remove another one and see if they can produce the same amount. Well, obviously, people are working harder, although they love to say they're working smarter, but right. they're working harder. Uh, <clears throat> you know, And all of this is measured down to a detail that uh, Frederick Taylor never could have dreamed of because now you have biometrics and all these ways of, of measuring actual work. Uh, and as I said before, the electronic surveillance of various kinds now, so that the ability to standardize work, if, if you look through management texts and, and articles these days, uh, when they talk about, they take a survey of, well, how do I improve functioning in my warehouse? The answer is standardize everything. So work is being reduced to its, its sort of minimum of skill, uh, and and in order to speed it up. So that's what lean production is. It, it means you take out the fat in the labor process, um, and you do this by mathematical measurements and, and you know, electronic measurement and so forth. It's this, much more scientific than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Right. This was, I think, uh, examined in that um, uh, mid-'80s in that movie uh, that Michael Keaton, that comedy Gung Ho. 
if I remember correctly. But I'm uh, drawing on a, a wide yeah, range of Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a crude uh, version of it. But that's uh, but it, yeah. I, I would love to go back. Actually, I mean, it, it, uh, that's what I re- I remembered as I was reading about the uh, uh, lean economy. I, I remember gung ho for whatever reason. I'd like to go back to see how uh, prophetic that may have been. Uh, but. Uh, Leaving gung ho aside for a moment, um, so we have all of these uh, supposed myths that um, that that uh, we have bought into on some level. I mean, certainly, I, I feel like over the the past ten or fifteen years, as we discussed the decline in 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 unionism, um, and obviously, like you say, there is there's other structural factors. But people have said that our the the nature of our workforce has declined. But the long and short of it is or I should, has changed. And the long and short of it, it has not changed that dramatically from other times where we have seen uh, labor exercise power. And then the the second, um, uh, I guess, section of your book talks about how capital has restructured itself in a way that is um, less maybe durable than we've also been led to believe. Is that is that a fair... Um, way of, 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 of characterizing it? Yeah, what, what I tried to do, you know, is there, there are a lot of books now, really good stuff on the nature of capitalism and capitalist crisis and, and sort of big trends measured, you know, in, in numbers and everything. What I tried to do is say, well, how is capital organizing itself? Uh, not only in the United States, but on a world scale, of course, but but definitely in the United States. And, and there are two things I looked at here. One is the enormous merger movement that began in the 90s and, and continues uh, even now, although it's not at the same speed. But the importance of that is that what businesses were doing and, and this hit literally every sector, not just manufacturing, but, but services, just about every service industry you can look at, and transportation and, and pretty much everything. Uh, what they've done is they've undone what was done in the 1960s. That is, they've gotten away from conglomeration. In the 60s, mergers were to create conglomerates, corporations that did lots of different things. And what Capital has discovered in in the the sort of fire of international competition is that it actually makes them more sense for them, particularly if they're going to apply things like what I was talking about before, lean production or whatever, to focus on you know the the things they do best. Sometimes they call this core competence or whatever you want to call it, but producing more or less the same type of product. Uh, throughout the the same corporation. So these companies are bigger, but they're more focused. And what this means is they're actually more like the corporations that union organized in the 1930s. They've kind of gone back to that. That is to say, USX dumped its oil subsidiary and became U.S. Steel again. Uh, The auto companies, um, well, two two of them, dumped their uh, financial units to concentrate, and as did GE, to concentrate on manufacturing and 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 so on. So, if you can get into these companies to to organize them, uh, you know, you instead of having to organize lots of tiny factories, you you can organize a company the way it was done more or less in in the 1930s. And then the, the second thing I looked at well, was how do they move things around? How, how are the nation's goods, whether they're imports or produced here, being moved around? Because when you, you look at not only the production of, say, final goods, like an automobile or something, but the production of services, all of these things depend on supply chains. And this is the other big reorganization of the last 20 to 30 years, and some of it is very new. Um, that is to say, they've streamlined the uh, a long, again, lean production notion, just-in-time delivery is particularly important in this. Let me, let me just, I, I want to go slow here for this, because this the, I, I found this logistic stuff to be really fascinating. Talk about that that just in time. Just, just I don't know if people are familiar with what that what that means. Right. Okay. 
This was introduced within factories, particularly in the automobile industry in the 80s. As I said, it's taken from Japan, from the Toyota system in particular. And what it says is in, in the, the old way manufacturing was done in just about any industry is that every, every product that is produced in turn uses inputs, other parts and components that, that come to them via a supply chain. The old way of doing that was the the final assembler, let's say General Electric or General Motors, would uh, stock these these parts. It would have huge amounts of inventory. But the problem is inventory is expensive, and lean production tells you you shouldn't be keeping these expensive inventories. You should be moving things as you need them, in other words, just in time. So these components come to the assembly line as needed. Uh, rather than sitting around in a warehouse somewhere. And so that has, that radically changed the way supply chains were structured because the just-in-time thing goes all the way down the supply chain. Uh, each, each step in the uh, production of a final product uh, is to be delivered uh, just in time you know, for production. That means everything is tighter. And, and also the final product is is there's a lot less. I mean, there there has been a lot more sort of like, I guess, <clears throat> smart inventorizing of the final product. Right. We're not going to pay to store uh, our final product in the same way that we may have like 30, 40 years ago. That's right. That's right. And so the inventories have been uh, elim- not eliminated, but reduced greatly. Uh, which, by the way, uh, I'll get to this in a second, but it's also changed the nature of warehousing and transportation. So with just-in-time, it it also means that these supply chains are much more vulnerable because if you have, let's say, a delay in in delivery of a a part to a key plant, uh, that key plant can't produce the car or the table or the refrigerator or whatever it is uh, without the part. And so this, this has become, uh, on the one hand, the, the way to compete is to move things faster like that uh, throughout the whole supply chain. On the other hand, though, it means every time there's a, a hurricane or a tsunami or, for that matter, a strike, it can affect the whole supply chain and and close down plants that aren't even directly affected by the weather or whatever it is. Uh, Actually, the most common disruption in supply chains these days is IT failure, uh, which I thought was interesting because they totally depend on, um, you know, IT to, uh, to keep track of the things that are moving along the supply chain. But anyway, so I, I, and, and let me also just say too, in terms of that that logistics too. I mean, I think this is uh, this is a little bit uh, a field, but this is applicable to a lot of other um, um, uh, issues that I think we're having in this country. You know, I mean, just in terms of like uh, even in food and stuff like this. I mean, these are, th- that that phenomena of of just in time and sort of like lean um, uh, production. Uh, it, has has really left a lot of supply lines very vulnerable.